I am delighted to be back. It seems like forever. And the only, thank you, the only sad note is this is the first time I've been here since Maxine Whitten died. And I'm finding that's a little bit difficult to deal with. Those of you that knew Maxine knew that we went back to our, oh, my preteens, I guess, and her early teens. So it's been a little bit hard. It's good to see the rest of you and see all these familiar faces. Shirley Countryman showed up. I've figured up I knew, I've knew i known her since 69, but it wasn't Shirley. I knew it was her husband. So I know a lot of preachers that I, and uh, men of the church that I never got to meet their wives, but it is a delight to be back, and I am very thankful to be here, and I thank Hetty for a good bed to sleep in last night, a good breakfast this morning, and all of you that have been able to come. One of the most controversial subjects in the Lord's Church today, and has been since um, it's been a major problem, I think, beginning in about 1974 when the women's lib movement started, and that is the role of women in the church. Uh, I don't like the discussions myself. I get tired of men telling me I don't know my place, and I get tired of women saying, I want to be all that I can be. I want to be free to do, and all of that kind of thing. God is very explicit in his instructions to women. He did not leave us ignorant, sisters. He told us what he wanted and what he expected of us. And we know that when we pick up our Bibles, if you use King James, American Standard, New American Standard, you know what God wants from you. Now, if Robert Taylor was here, well, he'd tell you you couldn't even read the NIV. So I just want you to know, even the NIV does not leave a doubt as to the role of women in the church. It is one of the areas in biblical instruction that will, it has always been, it is now, it will forever be an area of controversy because we don't want to know, we don't want to practice, or the world does not want to practice that which God has given us. In this age of liberation where it is the end thing to be rebellious against authority, and if you doubt that, you just walk through the malls and look at the way people dress and the way they behave from not only the men but the women and children. It's obvious that discipline is a word that is not often used. And by the way, I want to thank you for your vocabulary and your prayer. I am a, a word person and I used to love to listen to um, Buster Dobbs' brother Jim because he had a vocabulary that made you stretch. I heard one woman say, if Paul were writing today, he would not dare tell women to be silent. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write that women would be silent in the churches and then would turn right around and because of pressure from society say that they did not have to be? I heard another woman say, I don't care what Bible says. I will not be in submission to my husband. At the time, she was a teacher of my children in preschool, and she's one of the best Bible teachers I've ever run into. Had, had the most wonderful attitude towards small children. But when she said that, my blood ran cold. And this was, I was still young then, and it would have been very easy for me to follow that kind of thinking. But it just horrified me to think that any woman would take it upon herself to stand in direct opposition to God. As a woman, I do believe that many of our problems come from the fact that men have misinterpreted or misapplied that which God has commanded of him for his role. Many have mistaken headship for domination. You still occasionally run into men who are brave enough to say, oh, I've got that little woman under my thumb. Don't you just want to hit them? <laughs> Wouldn't you just love to change places with them for one day? and exercise that same kind of headship over them. But our problem is that we are not responsible for what they teach. We are responsible for knowing what God said to us. So we must individually and collectively cut through everything that man generic is teaching today Anything that's being taught in the world, anything that's being taught in denominations, any example that they are setting, it is our individual Christian responsibility to get through all of that garbage and go back to what did God say to me? What did the Holy Spirit direct the writers to record? 
It is accepted that each of the New Testament writers wrote in his own style according to his own uh, methods, but he was directed by the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote to Romans, Greeks, Jews, and all Christians in between. John wrote to prove the divinity of Christ. James wrote to Hebrew Christians and Matthew to followers who were not yet Christians. Yet all wrote according to the, what the Spirit was revealing to them. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Man in that verse is the... Do we have any Greek scholars? Do we have anybody read? Good. <laughs> I can pronounce it the way I want to. This has been real fun. Man in verse 17 is the Greek word anthropos, meaning human, thus male, female. It is a generic term. So all of us have the responsibility then to be completely and thoroughly <laughs> equipped for every good work. If we understand these things, we will more easily re accept the reality then of the divine restrictions under which we, as women of God, must serve. When Maxie called and gave me my assignment, I thought, oh no, not again. Don't they know I can speak on something else? But he confined me to two main scriptures, 1 Timothy 2, 8-15 and 1 Corinthians 11, 2-26. To do this, we need to uh, be sure that we're all reading from the same text. And for your information, I was using the New American Standard, and it was um, the title is the Hebrew Greek Study Bible, New American Standard Versions, with notes by its editor, Spiros Zohiatis, I think his name is. It's another Greek word. Other versions I used as commentaries. This man has done an excellent study of this, and I carefully researched and talked with my elders and with our preacher to be certain that I had not misunderstood or had not taken any of his footnotes as scripture rather than as commentary. In 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 15, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. And uh, then picking up in uh, 3 verses 14 and 15, Paul gives a set of instructions to Christian women concerning their conduct in the church. First, he says, I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works as befits women, making a claim to godliness. Let a woman quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman, being quite deceived, fell into transgression. But women shall be preserved through the bearing of children, if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. And then skipping down in the third chapter to 14, 15. I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you may know how to conduct yourself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Paul doesn't leave us wondering why he gave these instructions. He said, I want you to know how to behave yourself. Now, back at the beginning, he said we're not supposed to adorn ourselves with pearls and braided hair and costly gold and so forth. Does that mean that we cannot embellish our looks? I think not. In fact, I pray not because I like makeup and I like modest jewelry. What he's trying to make us understand, and I think you do, is that if we spend excessive time, money, and energies in decorating the outer self, then we have deprived our Lord of the time, money, and energies that should have been spent in His work. We deprive our families. Husbands like to see their wives looking nice, of course, but how many husbands have you heard complain because it takes his wife an hour and a half to get out of the bathroom or to put her face up? put a face on in the mornings. I worked for a doctor and I complimented him one day on how beautiful his wife was and he said, it all comes out of a bottle. <laughs> and she spent so much time 
preparing her face in the mornings that she didn't have time to get her children dressed and off to school. They had to have a maid do that. And this is the kind of attitude that Paul's talking about, where we are so self-centered and so egocentric that we will not, we spend so much time on our outer appearance that we forget that we are supposed to align our priorities with God's will. God is not concerned with the outer self. He knows how we look with no makeup and our hair uncombed. What he wants is a beautiful spirit and a heart that is his. <laughs> Paul in verse 9 uses the word modestly, and the Greek word is A-I-D-O-S, and discreetly, and the Greek word is S-O-P-H-R-O-S-U-N-E. I'm going to pronounce it sophrosune or something similar to that. Eidos is defined as bashfulness toward man and awe or reverence toward God. How many of us anymore behave bashfully toward man? <laughs> you know, it's kind of a shame that so many times, and I, I stand condemned before you because um, sometimes I think God cursed me with a sense of humor, but it has come in handy through the years. But sometimes my sense of humor just kind of gets carried away and I realize I'm not behaving very bashfully toward men and tend to treat them more as my equal rather than me as in submission to them. But all a reverence toward God. I am horrified at the number of Christian women who use Lord and God in their everyday conversation as slang and they don't even know they're doing it. A bulletin article came to my house one time, front page of the bulletin article where my postman could read it, and the preacher had referred to Christ as J.C. all through the article. And I wrote him back and I said, I don't know what Lord you serve, but mine would not be addressed as J.C. I've never received another bulletin from that preacher. We must show all our reverence toward our God. We must never, ever bring him down to our plane in our most secret thoughts or any of our actions. So Dias has said that the key to this verse is the word sophrosuni. And the closest tran English translation then to that word would be sober-mindedness. And I read from his book, The truth of the matter is that in Christianity, women became free equal to their husbands. Now he's referring back to 1 Timothy. The danger, however, was always present that they might misuse this newfound freedom and take it beyond the limitations that God had placed in appointing man as head over woman in the marital relationship. According to 1 Corinthians 4, 7, there can be absolutely no two people or things exactly the same. In other words, we have to have a head and we have to have one in submission. Woman cannot be equal with man in the marriage relationship, nor can woman be equal with man in the church relationship. Man is to be head. The inherent differences in people and things must be recognized by the sophron person. This is a person who recognizes who he is, or in our case, who she is, what she is, what he can and cannot do, and how she must behave in certain given circumstances. The whole thesis of the Apostle Paul is that women should not try to look or act like men and should not attempt to usurp the position of their husbands in the home and in the church, thus maintaining the parallel of the church as the bride of Christ. My mother was worshiping in a congregation where the preacher had a soapbox and it was length of hair. The fact that he was teaching Aggies, who uh, I think one of them might have had his hair down to his earlobes. You know, the rest of them have white walls. But every Sunday I went, he preached on the length of women's hair. And finally my mother told me she'd reached the conclusion that I was sinning by having my hair so short. Well, his whole thesis was that you mistake the woman for a man. And I said, Mother, anybody that looks at me knows I am not a man. Now, if that is the only objection he has to my short hair, he is in error. We are not to do anything, though, from the way we dress to the way we wear hair to anything that would mislead people as to our sexuality. 
So the length of the hair then becomes a minor incident unless it is cut in such a fashion to be deliberately misleading. I have two books I want to recommend to you. They're both written by F. Lagarde Smith. I don't know how you feel about him. I like the man. I have read this book. I have underlined it. I have recommended it to my elders and to the preacher and our, where we worship. It is the cultural church, and he is addressing the problems that are inherent in the church today, being spread all over the brotherhood about how we, as the church of Christ, must conform to the world to keep our young people happy. And he answers that as well as anybody I have ever read. Now, he also has a book... And he was not married when he wrote that. He has since married, and I've heard a number of women say, I wonder if he still feels the same way. It's uh, what most women want and what few women find. It was originally entitled Strong Men. Oh, I never get that title right. Strong Men for Christian Women or something to that effect. He has a wonderful attitude toward woman as woman, but he also does not in any way, form, or fashion deviate from scripture as to woman's role. I, I like the man, but he has one line in uh, the book on the cultural church that I underline and put a paper clip on. He said, hardly any biblical principle is more clearly established than the principle of male spiritual leadership. And I think that pretty well sums it up. Then I have, I found some, um, a bulletin article from um, Magnolia Bible College. And this man says, we hear the cry, why should anyone be kept from doing something they are perfectly capable of doing just because they were born female? With Jimmy Jividen, I declare, I do not know. I could speculate about the distinctive natures of man and woman. I could say that Paul, like Paul, that she was last created and first to sin. I could, as a clay pot, cry out to the potter, Why did you make me thus? Still, there would be mystery. I just know that God has decreed that man must bear the responsibility of leadership and woman bears the responsibility of motherhood. And then James Baird said in an editorial examining the role of today's women in the church, the controversy over women's role in the assembly is critical because of its divisiveness. What happens in the worship of a congregation affects every member of that congregation. To insist that women have leading roles in worship requires those who cannot conscientiously worship in this way to either go against their conscience, a sin, according to Romans 14.23, or leave that con congregation causing a cleavage in the body of Christ also sin. Now that we have looked, have been cautioned about the outward manifestations, let's go to the heart of the matter, and that is divine restrictions. God said, I believe, 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15, to be an obvious parallel to 1 Corinthians 11, 34 through 35, since they both deal with the conduct within the worship service. So let us keep within that context. A lot of times when you're studying a topic or you want to make a point, and uh, teachers quite often do this, you reach and you stretch. We're not going to do that today. We're limiting ourselves to the home and to the worship service. I don't know how I feel about women in positions of authority in the world. I really don't. I've never wanted it. I've never had it. So it is not a problem for me. These things I do know. My God told me about the home and the church. Those two things, I have to be in accordance with his will. We are not dealing with man's interpretation, but we are dealing rather with what is God's will. 1 Timothy 2.8 reads, Therefore I want the man in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissensions. Men here is from the Greek, anor, which is always, always underlined, male, fellow, or husband. Therefore we have no problem understanding that it is that in the assembly it is the men who are to pray. Now, does that exclude women from ever praying? No. Why do you think we need ladies' Bible classes? So that our women will learn to pray and to pray in public. We need that time 
And let me say this, if any of you have opportunity to attend ladies' classes, lady, regular ladies' Bible classes, and you do not, please start. It's the one place in the church that you have a voice in accordance with God's will, where we can study with one another and glean wisdom one from another. I delight in sitting at the feet of our elderly women and hearing them teach and share their experiences with us. I delight in the beautiful young faces that are so eagerly searching out God's will and in your ladies' Bible classes or the place where you develop. It does, this admonition from Paul, does exclude women from public prayer or public assembly prayer to men. It's interesting when you start studying this or discussing this topic, the first thing that comes up is, is Bible class considered the assembly? My question is, did they have Bible classes as we know them today in that time? I hardly think so. They didn't have buildings as we have buildings, so uh, I don't understand the people that had the controversy then about kitchens in the building. You don't, can't go back to New Testament and find a basis for that, strictly prohibiting it. There are a number of things that through the years we have made into problems through private interpretation that are not in Scripture. For one thing, and I think I mentioned this further on down, when we're, reading, when we're expo expounding on these Scriptures today, we will we'll almost invariably insert the word per public, public assembly. That is not in the script. It is the assembly. All right, then, since they didn't have Bible classes, as we understand them today, where you separate and go to little rooms and you have a specified teacher and everything, uh, does that free us, then, to do as we will in class? The author says, refers back to the definition of sophrosuni. Can we take part in home and class discussions without losing that quality of submissiveness that we are commanded to exhibit. Some of us can, some of us cannot. Those of us who cannot must keep our mouths shut. Some arguments include, number one, women are often more learned than men and should be allowed to teach mixed adult classes. My question to you is, why are they more learned? Because our men do not study and cannot express their thoughts or is it because domineering conduct and authoritative voices have so emasculated our men that they are afraid to speak or teach? You know, we have done that in many ways. Our women through the years have become so strident in their voices and in their domineering conduct within a classroom that many, many adult classes, the men just sit there and never offer. And they say, why should I study? So-and-so is going to take over anyway. I condemn our men for not studying and not preparing themselves to teach. I think it's a shame that we have so few men who are qualified to expound on the scriptures because of laziness. It just, it just breaks my heart to sit in an adult class and watch the man teaching the class try so desperately to get our men to take part and they just sit there and who knows where their minds are. But is that our place then to override them and do that which we know we can do better? No. If man gave permission, does that mean woman would not be usurping his authority? We have a group of elders and they say, well, we as elders of this congregation consider the Bible class not to be part of the public assembly, therefore we are giving permission, now this has happened in the congregation in Houston, for a young woman who happens to be a very good Bible scholar to teach the mixed adult class. No. No. My question then is, can man override God's instructions? No. Paul said by inspiration, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Paul's concern was that we never lose sight of God's order, God, Christ, husband, wife. In the church as in the home, he established this hierarchy and man cannot underline, cannot change it. Three, what about women without husbands? Here again, we must go back to the admonition of being discreet and sober-minded. In the church, the woman is to be submissive to man. Elders are appointed to feed the flock. 
Please, God, we have wise elders, and they are fully qualified according to Scripture. Wise men are to teach. Here again, please, God, that we have teachers who will, men who will study and will spend time with the Word and will strive diligently to prepare themselves for it. And then we come to us. Older women are to teach younger women, Titus 2, 3, and 5. We have no lack of designated teachers. So the problem then has to be in the attitude and conduct of the women. 1 Corinthians 11, 2 through 16 is an example of what happens when women try to take the role given men. Paul uses the uncovered head as an example of loss of distinction between male and female. I was um, in Austin and uh, I'm offhandedly made the comment that um, if it takes wearing a veil to show our Christianity, then I suspected we'd better start wearing the veil so that we would be in submission to our husbands. Well, that got me in a lot of trouble, but I think sincerely that if that is the only thing that will remind me constantly that I am to be in submission to the men, then I must do that. I do not think it is a direct command today that we wear the veil. I think that is one of those things that comes under the role of culture. But if it is an offense for me to go unsheltered, then I must put a covering on my head. Any effort on the part of women, such as teaching or dressing in the manner of man, would be destructive to the overall order of rule given by God. I want to recommend another book to you. It's uh, written by Hicks and Morton, members of the church, and I think it comes from Lambert Publishing. And it's Woman's Role in the Church. They do an excellent study of this. Now, as a woman, let me share with you now that it is no secret to us, and I think if all of you answered honestly, you would say yes to this, that if we are given an inch, a determined woman will immediately take a mile. It just doesn't take much effort when you get your toe in the door to start easing it open just a little bit more and a little bit more. Because we are this way, because we have this propensity, the Spirit saw fit to break down the areas of specific demands. And here again, I have to reiterate, reiterate we are not left in ignorance. All we have to do is pick up our Bibles and study to know that men slash husbands are to lead, women slash wives are to follow. If you don't have a husband, you have elders. You're to be under their dominion. You are to be submissive to them. If you have a husband, no matter what kind of man he is, your first rule of behavior is that you are to be submissive to him unless it violates your service to your Lord. The command in Ephesians 5.21 to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ is general. I think it's very interesting that Paul first wrote that. He said, be subject to one another. Generally, each of us is to be in submission one to the other. In, other, in another scripture, it says, looking always for other people's welfare first. Then, the specific delineation of position follows. It is after we have developed the attitude of servanthood and of submission one to another, generic, that we come to the uh, verses 22 and 23 where we are commanded then. It is no longer a suggestion. It is a command. Women are to be in submission to their husbands. Husbands are to be in submission to Christ. If the man or husband does not fulfill his role, the woman or wife must never be guilty of violating hers. Two sins do not make a right. You cannot correct your husband's or the elder's down uh, failings by overpowering them and usurping their authority. Historically, the pagan women of, of Corinth had been accustomed to taking prominent roles in the worship, in the Delphinian worship. This is where they spoke in the unknown tongues. And they were usurping the authority of men. They had positions of authority over the men. Paul was teaching us that this must not continue in the Lord's church. Christians were to be different. We wouldn't dream of offering virgins in a religious sacrifice, but that's what they did. We, we do not want to accept the paganism that was in the Corinthian church before Paul taught them more explicitly. Why then do we worry about 
seeking roles of leadership for ourselves. Paul, by direct inspiration, I repeat, says, Let the women keep silence in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak. <sighs> Pat Suba paraphrase might be, Women, wives, I said keep still. I was being nice for the manuscript. What I would say is shut up. <laughs> let men, let our men who by creation and by law given after each usurpation of authority, they are to be the leaders. Let them be free to do their work with our constant overbearing disruption. The phrase teach or exercise over a man can be broken down into several words. First one is D-I-D-A-S-H-E-I-N, which means to teach continually and often tell to act of oneself or dominate. 1 Timothy 2.12 is the only place in New Testament that the word often tell is found. I learned a lot of things doing this, and I, I had not realized that there is only one place that often tell is used. The Greek word often tease, one who practices often teo, refers to one who is so determined to have her own way that she would murder her own family to have it. Now I think I've never known a woman who was that determined to have her own way, unless you're speaking of spiritual murder, and then there are a number of those among us. But can you imagine wanting your own way so badly, and particularly when it's applied to exercising authority over men, that you would murder your own family to get that? The phrase, well, let me see. It, no wonder Paul was so adamant that Christian women, and he used the word train themselves, to be silent in the assembly. God knew when he created us how much we would love to be in dominion over man. We must then educate ourselves and train ourselves so that we can be pleasing to him but be silent in the assembly. Paul was setting down principles by which the Lord's body was to be governed till the end of time. God gave two specific areas of law. Two specific areas where woman must be in submission. Creation and law. Creation, where woman was made from man for man in marriage and in law that was established after Eve led Adam to sin. Anytime we deviate from, man's, from God's law, the doors open for all kinds of consequences, spiritual, social, and physical. Had man, and I use this in the generic term now, not abuse God's laws of sexual conduct, there would not be homosexuality, lesbianism, and bestiality. And it is our problem to remember that just because they exist does not make them right. I am sick unto death of the gay movements and the lesbian movements where they say we have our rights. And how terrible it is that people think God does not accept them or God condemns them because they are gay, because they have their own lifestyle. I don't want any teacher teaching my children in public schools that they must accept homosexuality as a, an accepted way of life. If we are to combat this, mothers, older women, teachers, wives, grandmothers, we must constantly and consistently insist that our children understand God created male and female and they each have their role. I listened to a young preacher one Wednesday night make the statement, and I admit I almost passed out in shock. He said, homosexuality is not a sin. Bear with me. His next line was, the practice of homosexuality is the sin. A loose tongue is not a sin unless you do not curb it and control it. So understand, I don't know what causes homosexuality or lesbianism. I do not know. I read the articles, I study the books, and I still do not know. This I do know. God condemns the practice 
of homosexuality. God condemns the practice of lesbianism. So where I do heartily agree with the brethren that say we must teach and educate and accept those who are willing to turn away from that lifestyle, I will not ever condone that conduct or their deliberate choice to practice that kind of sexuality. I do not believe God expects that of us. I do believe that He wants us to have hearts so full of love we will do everything in our power to teach them more perfectly and to support them if they turn away from that lifestyle. From infancy, children must be taught. They must be taught that they have a God-given role. If they are little boys, teach them to be gentle men. If they are little girls, teach them to be strong women. Women who can, in, the, in cases of necessity, take care of themselves. I think for many years we really failed, and this is an insert here, we really failed in not training our daughters to be widows. How many widows do we have in here this morning? In any congregation that you attend, you will find a number of widows. And so many, many times women are left without any knowledge of how to take care of themselves. That's part of their training too, you know. Just like it's part of the little boy's training to be a good father. Uh, I don't know what your experience has been in this, but I used to teach teenage <laughs> girls all the time, and I was just horrified at the congregations where I was asked to teach. They always had a girls' class on how to be good wives and mothers, but not one out of 500 would have a class on to train, how to train the boys to be good husbands and fathers. This is one of those things we need to whisper in our husband's ears at night. Since to my knowledge, and I, I have asked a number of men about this, and we all reach the same conclusion that the only scriptural restrictions placed on women are in the church and the home, then her obligation outside her worthiness outside of those areas would be then restricted only by morals and propriety. I, for one, don't think it is uh, very proper for a woman to be a lineman for the telephone company. I just don't see any femininity in putting on those spikes and climbing those telephone poles. Now, if that's your thing, it's all right. I couldn't do it. But I think we need to be aware, always, of the example that we're setting and remember that God's woman is to be in submission and is to be a feminine creature. Members of the Lord's Church today are using the argument that everybody does it. <coughs> Not so. Not so. You look around and there are a lot of mothers that don't let their girls dress like tramps. There are a lot of mothers that won't let their boys wear the crotch of their pants down to their knees. There are even a lot of mothers that make their children have decent haircuts. I have one grandson. He's the flake of the family, I think. He has this one little tiny braid that hangs right here. And I thought I was going to have to restrain my mother in a straitjacket when she saw it because she was immediately ready to cut it off. I just looked at the watch. Uh, let me skip over. We, there, there is so much. I do want to... Uh, oh, Priscilla and Aquila, you know, we have a number of brethren, and I, I argue with them about this, that uh, Priscilla taught Aquila, taught with Aquila as an equal, and because her name comes first in everything but King James, that meant she was probably the more intelligent and more domineering of the two. <laughs> Poppycock. I do not believe that. I think that teaching violates all the rest of New Testament. I think Priscilla's actions were always in submission to her husband and as his support so that he could do the work that God intended for him to do. I think she encouraged him, but I don't think she took the lead. And as an interesting note, this is something else I learned this time. You know that not ever is Priscilla mentioned, except in connection with Aquila. Nowhere is she noted as being a teacher on her own. And does this not then uphold the teaching that the law of submissiveness was in effect then, as it is an example for us today? I referred to the uh, seminar in 1974, the women's lib movement uh, was getting a start in Austin, and it was horrible. 
It was really horrible. And uh, one of the young women who was a proponent of women in leadership roles was asked, why do you want to be a preacher, elder, etc.? And her answer was power. Now, does this sound like a woman in submission to her God? But then is her attitude any less abhorrent than uh, it would be to him if we rebel in silence and manipulate and control any way we can so that we get our way? I heard one woman laugh, an older woman, by the way, laugh one time. She said, <laughs> he might be the head, but I'm the neck. And I thought, superficially, that's funny. But what does it reveal? What attitude does it reveal? Now, are we guilty then of murmuring and complaining and um, quite often using our bodies to manipulate our men to get our way? I think that's just as disgusting to God as those that openly rebel and say, I will not be in sub submission. Should an individual eldership grant permission to a woman to teach or hold position over a man and she does it, then all have sinned. If the Lord's Church is to survive the 20th century, we must go back to doing all things according to His will. Women who would be teachers must teach whom and where God gave permission. Women who would be wise must recognize their responsibility to be God-directed wives in submission to their own husbands. Women who would be Christians must recognize that they must be in submission to those who have the rule over them. We do not have the right to demand that the church be conformed to the ways of the world. I get really upset when I hear our men saying that we have to change, the church has to change. I don't believe that. Uh, I think that's in violation of Romans 12, 1 and 2, and I would ask you to read that. I want to sum up with something that I wrote in 1974, and I have not changed my attitude about this. By my very submission to the will of God, I have been freed to be a slave under the perfect law of liberty. Romans 6, 17, 18, James 1, 25. I am, by being a servant of Christ, free to be in subjection to my own husband. I am free to seek those fruit of the Spirit that guarantee life everlasting. I am free to serve under men who have qualified themselves as bishops and watchmen over my soul. God forbid that I ever forget the command to obey your leaders and submit to them, for they have the watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Hebrews 13:17. I am free to uphold and support my brothers in Christ, whatever their capacity, in their efforts to be strong men of God. As a matter of fact, they cannot be strong if I do not support them. I am free to teach and to train my young friends and relatives in Christ to grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I am free to work at any task assigned to me and to do it heartily as unto the Lord, without concern as to public position or who gets the credit. Romans 14, 7 through 12 and verse 19. I think that we must, as women, willingly submit ourselves to our husbands and to our elders or we will not see heaven. Is it too much to ask that we train ourselves to be beautifully submissive, joyfully submissive, when we know that heaven is the reward? I think not. We must be women in submission, recognizing God's restrictions. I am woman. I am the vessel God chose to bear His Son. I am the only helper suitable for man. I am the mother of all living, the giver of comfort, the essence of beauty, the teacher of good things, the keeper of the home, the backbone of the local congregation, the stirrer of men's souls and that which aggravates them most, the answer to a child's cry in the night, the steadfast support of the man I love and or the elders under whom I serve. I am the one to whom no task is too menial or lacking in glory if it aids and comforts another. I am the stern disciplinarian because my children in the flesh and in the spirit 
are an heritage from the Lord to be trained in His way. I am sister to brothers I will never see, but who need me to pray for them and help provide for their needs, to weep with them when they weep and rejoice when they rejoice. I am sister to untold thousands of women striving to be all that God wants them to be. All these things and more, I am because I am woman. Thank you.